One of the things that affects us most as we age is one of the complaints I hear so often beyond hot flashes and weight gain is brain fog and memory loss. And certainly concerns about memory loss or dementia as we age and what that actually, what that looks like, how that will transform us. What, you know, what are some things that we can do to prevent it? And what about the mysterious hormone therapy? There's so much still misinformation about hormones and uh, menopause, as well as mental health and longevity and brain health, that I want to address those in this interview today. Today, I'm bringing you Dr. Lisa Moscone. I'm bringing her back to the Girlfriend Doctor podcast. I interviewed her a few years ago, a couple years ago, and she's just one of the favorite, one of our favorite interviews of all time time. Oh, I'm so, so glad to hear that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. This is a hot topic. And so Dr. Lisa Moscone, she is a PhD and associate professor of neuroscience and neurology and radiology at Well Cornell Medicine, New York Presbyterian Hospital, where she serves as director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Program, which can, includes the NIH funded Women's Brain Initiative. So I'm really excited to talk with you today, Lisa, about this so important issue. Welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. Thank you. And thank you for having me again. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Well, since we talked last, you've been busy studying women's brains. And I want you to kind of go into your research a, a little bit and really why women and men have different um, uh, mental functions when it comes to hormones in our brains, as well as just in general, the differences, cognitive ability, learning, memory. Absolutely. This, this has been really the main focus of my research for as long as I can remember, because I started in high school asking these questions, and then it really turned into my, my PhD thesis, in part because I have a family history of Alzheimer's disease that affects the women in my family. So, my, so I'm from Florence in Italy. I'm Italian, hence the accent. <laughs> And my grandmother effectively raised me because my parents were so busy working. And in Italy, it's quite normal to spend a lot of time with your grandparents. And my grandma was a powerhouse. She was really such a strong, intelligent, bright woman until she started showing signs of cognitive decline when I was starting my PhD which then later on turned into a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And what was really super scary on top of my grandmother uh, deteriorating at that point was that my grandmother was one of four siblings, three sisters and one brother. All three sisters developed Alzheimer's disease and died of it, whereas the brother did not. And they all lived to the same age. So I started asking this question right away. Does it matter if you are a woman or a man? Are women at higher risk of dementia than men? And back then, people would say to me that it, it, wasn't, it wasn't really about being a woman. It was just age. I hate that term. It, it's just been told to me my whole career. It's just aging in that Alzheimer's is a disease of old age. And they, they said, right, Alzheimer's is a disease of old age and women live longer than men. So at the end of the day, more women than men suffer from Alzheimer's disease. And that really never quite made total sense to me because women don't live that much longer than men. But if you consider that here in the United States, the longevity gap is about four years. But if you look at England, for instance, the difference is only two years, but Alzheimer's is the number one cause of death for women and not for men, right? And also four years is not such a big difference to really justify the fact that out of all Alzheimer's patients, more, well, let's say nearly two thirds are women, right? So for every three patients with Alzheimer's disease, two are women, that's a big disparity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what my research showed, and I, I'm going to shorten, <laughs> I can talk about this forever, but <laughs> what my research showed and other people have shown is that Alzheimer's is not actually a disease of old age. In reality, it's a disease of midlife with symptoms that start in old age. 
But what we do with brain imaging, I have a PhD in neuroscience, but also nuclear medicine, which is a branch of radiology, which is why I am a professor of radiology. Welcome now. What we can do with brain scans right now is to see these negative changes that take place inside your brain in midlife that over time accumulate and eventually result in the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And so then the whole question changed, right? If the disease starts in midlife, then what happens to women and not to men in midlife that could potentially explain the greater lifetime risk for women? And by doing a ton of tests and a ton of studies, we eventually landed on menopause, which is why we're here today, of course, is how you and I met, talking about menopause and the possible impact of menopause and brain health starting in midlife. So does Alzheimer's start in midlife for men too? Do you see those changes or is it is it delayed as well? You know, that's such a good question. So if you read uh, textbooks about Alzheimer's disease, what people say is that Alzheimer's can start as early as midlife, certainly years, if not decades, before cognitive symptoms. And the average age of onset of Alzheimer's disease in the United States is 72 years. But once you break it down by sex, what we have found and other people are, are finding is that the trajectory is different for women. So women start showing those signs, as red flags for Alzheimer's earlier on than men. But what happens is that women have this ability to compensate for the brain changes and tend to maintain cognitive performance for longer, right? In a way, we're compensating, we're able to find alternative pathways and their memory is better to start with relative to men, which is not, it's not saying that men have bad memory, just objectively on standardized neuropsychological tests women outperform men by a little bit at any age and even after a diagnosis of dementia. What that means is that it's really hard to diagnose dementia early in women, hmm. right? Because you have Alzheimer's in your brain, you have compensation, so you don't really show severe symptoms until later on in life is a little bit of a double-edged sword because that also precludes an early diagnosis for some women and treatments right. Right. Are available. So in your research, and you're one of the first, if not the first person imaging women's brains and yeah. during menopause and the first, what is I happening? Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, brilliant that and it's tragic that your yes. family history led you to this. And, but like, you know, I love your passion behind it, that seeking answers, not, you know, waiting for, you know, what might happen in the future. Right. Yes. You know, it's really interesting. I I've come to realize that there are two major types of scientists. There are scientists who take risks and try to find new things and answer new questions. And then there are scientists who learn about these discoveries, which are obviously smaller, right? You, you can't you start a new study from scratch. It's going to be a smaller study, but then other scientists take the knowledge that you developed and they scale it. Yeah. And then you can do a lot more with that. And both type of scientists are really, really important. I belong to the former group. <laughs> I just realized recently how much I beat my own drum in a way because I keep hearing this is the first time that anyone's done this. This is the first time that brain scientists looked at menopause and it keeps coming up. And it's quite, as a woman, I find it really offensive. And that's the way I felt when we landed on menopause as a possible female-specific trigger or risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And I said to my team, I said, well, what's been done, right? All the students immediately go to PubMed, do a literature search. I need every single paper that's been published looking at how the brain changes as a woman goes through menopause. Mm -hmm. And five minutes later, they were back to me and they're like, there's none, there's wow. none. Yeah, we, that, that was easy. That was the easiest search. There's nothing to be found. And I was like, well, that's ridiculous. 
And luckily, we happen to be working with midlife women with and without a, a family history of Alzheimer's disease. And so we started working with the ob department, with the ob department, with our colleagues at Wild Cornell, and before then at NYU Medical. I was at NYU before. And together, we were able to do something that was not really common back then. And look, that was like 2013, 2014, when no one was talking about menopause. It was certainly not a hot topic at all, especially in my field. And so it was very strange for us to talk to our patients about their menstrual cycles and whether or not they had half flashes or brain fog. And it was quite, quite interesting, quite a learning experience for us as well, because you know, nobody trains you in menopause care if you're a neuroscientist. There's just nothing. I don't think it was even mentioned to me uh, when I was studying and I had 23 years of formal education. So it, it's interesting. But so we went back and we asked all our participants about their menstrual status and their menopausal status. And then we were able to work with them over time and to follow them doing brain scans, brain imaging and multiple time points. By the way, I thought you were coming to do a little brain scan. Uh, I know I'm going to still get there. I will get there. <laughs> Next time I'm in New York. Yes. I got to New York. But so what we found is that menopause really is a neurologically active state where your brain is in transition together with the ovaries. And all the symptoms that women report that are quite disruptive besides no longer having a menstrual cycle or an irregular menstrual cycle and the bodily symptoms, the heart palpitations and the joint pain, the brain symptoms of menopause are really hard to handle for many, many women. And we're looking at half flashes, which actually are neurological symptoms, right? It's not like your skin has an issue, it's your brain that's glitching, mm -hmm. regulating body temperature. And so many women are just not aware. But also the brain fog is a huge issue for over two thirds of all women in perimenopause in early postmenopause, and also sometimes in the late postmenopausal phase, as well as mood changes and low libido, which mm -hmm. you can talk to us about, as well as everything else, and, and the anxiety and the depression and the, the memory lapses that can be so severe to really raise concerns about early dementia. We have so many patients who come to us because they're like, I can't remember things, screen me for Alzheimer's disease, do a brain scan, do something, because they are terrified that the brain fog may be an early sign of Alzheimer's disease. And so what we learned is that the brain does change or can change quite a bit as women go through menopause, starting at the perimenopausal stage, which is actually when most of the action takes place neurologically, right? And we found changes in brain energy levels, changes in structure, in gray matter volume and white matter volume, changes in connectivity, changes in blood flow, ch changes in cellular energy production, which we can measure now with spectroscopy. Yeah, so we can measure ATP directly inside the brain. Everything I've ever measured changes. And that can easily explain the symptom, at least the brain fog, at least the brain fog. Right. And then you think you talk about anxiety and depression and difficulty sleeping. These are all neurologic conditions, right? These are all, and you think about the HPA axis, so HPA G yeah. axis. Yes. It's connected, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Everything is connected. And I think when we talk about menopause as a society, we usually just talk about what, about half of what menopause really is, right? We're always thinking about the reproductive aspects and the loss of fertility and the fact that you can't have children and your menstrual cycle is going away. But what we're missing is the connection, the powerful connection between the ovaries and the brain, which we're born with mm -hmm. as women and is then activated at puberty, is overactivated, overactivated during pregnancy. Every time a woman is pregnant, and then it goes kaput a little bit during postpartum, during that very sensitive period of time. And then it's actually partially dismantled with the menopause transition. 
And these changes have consequences, not just in terms of mental cycle regulation, but really in terms of brain function and, and brain energy levels and the way that the brain functions overall. There's a switch towards different energy fuels. There's a switch towards recruiting different parts of the brain to do certain things. And that matters. That really matters for women. And we never talk about it. There's no mention, for instance, of the range, not just the range of symptoms, but the severity range. So for instance, I, I usually compare menopause to pregnancy with some of our patients to explain what's happening. And we now know that after the baby is born, there's a range of possible emotional response to the postpartum period where some women are perfectly fine some people, some women experience baby blues. Some women have depression, postpartum depression, and the few women actually experience postpartum psychosis. So there is now an understanding that the impact on your brain can, can vary mm -hmm. with very different outcomes for different women, which then led to screenings, right? Once you have a baby, you go to the pediatrician and the mom is being screened for depression, which is fantastic. And from a pharmaceutical perspective, we are now working to develop drugs, medicines specific to postpartum depression, which is not the same type of depression as situational depression or serotonin-based depression or other, other kinds of depression. There's no such vocabulary or range for menopause. We yeah. just assume it's the same for everyone. Whereas it's very similar. Some women, a few women are almost suicidal during menopause, some women develop rage. Some women just, just cry and they're, they're effectively depressed, they're hormonally depressed. And there's just no recognition of, of this and there's no support system in place, which I find extremely upsetting. And there's all the stigma with the ageism, the stigma with menopause, there's the you know emotional transitions. And during a woman's menopause, maybe she still has teenagers at home, maybe yes. she's doing career changes. I mean, there's a lot of responsibility. There's just a lot of responsibility. So you add that to it. What was interesting when I was going through like a second peri, uh, early menopause or perimenopausal flare when I was 48, that's when I discovered like the keto green approach. And I read a study that was published in 2015 that looked at gluconeogenesis in the brain and that significantly drops off in perimenopause. So there's that and gluconeogenesis in the brain is estrogen dependent. But yeah. it also looks like it follows the progesterone curve. So like when we look at this, we want to, we're going to use diet, nutrition, lifestyle, especially in perimenopause and preparing for it. But talk about those changes, the effects of estrogen on the brain and progesterone on the brain and how we can intervene early. Yes. So I am thrilled to announce that on June 20th, our new study is going to be published in Scientific Reports, which is a nature journal and is the fifth most cited journal globally. So I'm very happy about that because we were able to measure estrogen activity in the brain of healthy women for the first time ever. To my knowledge, it's never been done before. And actually, I'm quite sure that it's never been done before. Again, my students. Yeah, that's <laughs> amazing. Bravo. Yeah. Yeah. So that was in 2019, because we were doing all this work on menopause. And I was like, well, we are saying that the changes in hormonal concentrations in the brain are really what drives some of the brain symptoms of menopause, but also the risk of Alzheimer's disease for some women. I don't know for sure unless I can measure that. And this is important to, to realize that there is no correlation between hormone concentrations in blood and hormone concentrations in brain, right? So the brain is, is this very special, peculiar organ that is very protected from the rest of the body. So hormones coming in from the ovaries certainly have an impact on the brain, but the brain can also make a lot of its own hormones, or at least some, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, whatnot, 
And so the system is partially independent from the function of the ovaries, which is great, right? Because otherwise we would go crazy every single month. So it's <laughs> important that the brain is able to maintain hormonal concentration, concentrations at different rates than whatever happens in the rest of the body. However, that makes it really hard to measure what's happening inside the brain. So that was 2019 and they went to my radiochemistry department and they said, I do imaging for a living. I do PET imaging, especially positron emission tomography imaging. And they said, I need a ligand, I need a tracer for estrogen in the brain. And they said, well, that's too bad because we don't have one. And they said, well, this is very strange because we have one of the best radiochemistry departments in the United States for sure. And so I said, is it just us? Or, I mean, can I get it somewhere else? Can we have it shipped? And they're like, no, no, no. There's just no way to do that in the brain. We have tracers for like breast cancer, mm -hmm. hormone for receptor, for hormonal receptors from the neck down, but we just can't get stuff across the brain mm -hmm. in a way that is measurable, that gives you a good signal. And I said, well, that is unacceptable. That is unacceptable. So we need to, we need to have one. I must have a tracer for brain estrogen. And so we went down to the bench, we went to work. And in 2020, we got FDA approval. Then of course we shut down for COVID for a while, unfortunately. But in 2021, we started scanning and it works really well, obviously. Otherwise we would not have a publication. And what we've learned is that the theories that we have about estrogen function in the brain in midlife are actually incorrect. Mm. The theory, the main theory is that once women are past the final menstrual period, within a few years, estrogen receptors in the brain shut down. And that's one of the rationales for not really using estrogen therapy for support of brain function after menopause. Hmm. What we have found is the opposite. We're working with women who are up to age 65, so over a decade postmenopause. Right. And we have, as usual, we have women who are premenopausal, perimenopausal, postmenopausal. We, we have the, the whole spectrum covered. What we find is that actually estrogen receptors increase as women go through perimenopause and then after the final menstrual period, which is likely some kind of compensatory response, or perhaps as a stress response to the lack of estradiol from the ovaries. So the brain has no choice in a way, or maybe so intelligent that it's like, okay, I don't have as much estrogen as I used to have. Let me grow more receptors. Yes. So they can just grab everything that I'm able to produce and that is still coming from the ovaries. So I think that's very important. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. So your brain, you. like the whole concept of neuroplasticity being yes. stuck. Okay, we've just proved that it continues to we continue to be neuroplastic and then actually developing new estrogen receptors. Yes. I mean, I thought it was, I thought that I drove my students insane because it was like, I'm not sure that this is right. You have to redo it until we're 100% sure that this is correct, right? And it, it is correct. I mean, we, we try it in every possible way. The reviewers also had no problems with, with the whole concept because we now understand that our brain is much more plastic, like you said, and much smarter in some ways, especially women's brains that are extremely resilient in so many different ways. And so it makes sense that there would be some kind of response to the decreasing estrogen levels where the brain is trying to adjust. And what we found I thought also was very interesting is that by measuring estrogen in the brain, we can tell postmenopausal women apart from premenopausal women with 100% accuracy, like complete separation, which you will never be able to do with a blood test. It's very hard to do with a blood test, depending on when you do the blood test, of course. But that was very interesting. But most interesting was that the signal also correlates with memory performance and with symptoms of brain fog and low mood. So that provides the first, to my knowledge, the first actual evidence that changes in estrogen concentrations in the brain are effectively a strong determinant or a predictor, at least, of this kind of symptoms, of brain symptoms during menopause. 
That's amazing. That's amazing. And so we're creating more receptor. We're creating more receptors, creating more sensitivity. The brain's continuing to grow and develop. But yet, even in those situations, you have the the Alzheimer's increasing. They're not yet. So this is my next step. Now we want to understand whether this increase in estrogen receptors eventually is wearing out your brain, right? Because the estrogen, if you don't use some kind of hormone therapy, there's only so long that the brain can, can keep making receptors, a very energetically consuming thing to do. So is that what leads eventually for some women to the formation of Alzheimer's plaques? And this is what we're looking at now. So we want to do two things. Number one, at what point in time do the receptors effectively shut down? Right. When does this window of opportunity close? And for some women, is that the time where the, um, when, when the Alzheimer's plaques are showing up in the brains of women who are predisposed to Alzheimer's disease? And we're also testing hormone therapy because the idea is, well, what, what if I feed these brain hormones? Is it going to be happier now? Can, can we find less of a response? in no symptoms and better cognitive performance. So I'm going to give you a lot of first times next oh, year. I <laughs> love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keep, keep telling more. Yeah, for sure. But to your point about progesterone, that's also an, an incredibly important hormone. And I, I find that estrogen gets all the attention, but progesterone is also really important. So a next step would be to image progesterone concentrations in the brain. Same principle. Took me five years <laughs> to get wow. here, but hopefully now we have a framework to do things a little bit faster. So, so you haven't, so there's been no measuring of progesterone in the brain per se. No, no. Wow. Not in humans, not in humans. There are some tracers that are being developed in mice. So preclinically there's more action but translation to, to actual people has, it just hasn't been there because people just thought, scientists just thought that was impossible. Right, right. And I want to clarify too, as we're talking about progesterone, it is, we are not talking about synthetic progestins that aren't no. bioidentical to the body. But, and studies looking at progesterone and brain and neurodevelopment and uh, cognition and treatment of um, traumatic brain injury has shown favorable favorable effects. And what's interesting, when you see those symptoms in perimenopause, right, it really follows the decline of a progesterone, again, precursor to our sex hormones as well. So you see that decline. And, um, and so now what are you looking at as far as treatment beyond estrogen and perimenopause? And again, no age limit. The 10 million person study that was just published in April that looked at hormone therapy post-menopausal and women, you know, that were on Medicare, so technically over age 65, that um, were on hormones, long-term estrogens, and um, mostly looking at transdermal estrogens and progesterone versus progestins, they saw safety efficacy long-term postmenopausal. Yes. I think, I think we've known this yeah. for a while, but people just don't want to share it. Maybe, I don't know what it is. I think hormone therapy has such bad reputation and it's really taking a movement to clarify that the hormones that were harmful in some studies 20 years ago are not the same hormones that we use clinically now. And the hormones that we're using clinically are safe and well tolerated. And the risk of side effects is considered a rare occurrence by professional societies, right? As of 2022. Right. They've revised their guidelines and they're much more open. They're also saying you don't have to discontinue hormone therapy just because you're a certain age. If it helps you and you have the symptoms, well, obviously be careful, monitor the risks, obviously, but there's no need to routinely discontinue just because of age or because you've been on it for a certain amount of years. Whereas 
up to 2022, it was the lowest possible amount of hormones right. or the shortest possible amount of time. And if you're older than X, you got to stop, right? Which seemed quite like, uh, you know, there's a lot of research that shows safety and good results and beneficial effects that's not quite captured yet. So I'm very happy that the guidelines have changed. What I would love to see, what I would love to see is for the American Academy of Neurology to start talking about menopause. Because right now, I, I'm not an OBGYN. You know, the North American Menopause Society is wonderful. But if we, I'm, I work in neurology right now. So I, I run the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic, the Women's Brain Initiative. It's all in the Department of Neurology. And if we look at professional societies, it's the American Academy of Neurology, the AAN. And there's no guidelines for neurologists to even address menopause. There's no CPT codes they were able to use other than extended visit. You know? And I think that has to change because I mean, everybody's wonderful and everybody wants to help, but different specialists have different strengths, right? They bring different knowledges to the table. And what we can offer, I believe is quite helpful, like cognitive testing, neurological assessments, neuropsychiatrist assessments, imaging, brain imaging. And that I think should be available to women who have concerns related to their brain health, right? Yes, no, absolutely. And you talk about this. I'm going to plug your book. You guys, everyone needs to get uh, Dr. Lisa Moscone's book, The Menopause Brain. So it's entitled The Menopause Brain. It's available at anywhere books, uh, books are sold now. And it just goes through this really well. And one of the things that um, I love that you addressed in here was the importance of, of brain um, maintaining brain integrity and volume as we age. So as we age, we'll see a shrinkage of the hippocampus if, you know, an estrogen deficiency specifically, yes. but the, you talk about um, seeing an improvement of this, the size, the volume with hormone, hormonal intervention. There are a few things that seem to help and some studies Yes, actually, we found it too. Um, so descriptively, at least, we do find that hormone therapies and longer estrogen exposure throughout a woman lifespan seems to be protective. And actually, <laughs> we did one of the first studies with brain imaging showing a positive effect. And I'm very happy that it was just confirmed in meta-analysis, two large meta-analyses, looking at all the evidence collectively, showing that uh, hormone therapy, like you mentioned, micronized estro estradiol and micronized progesterone, more often than not transdermal administration, are not only safe and well tolerated, but they've, they've also been shown to support some aspects of cognitive function and to be associated with a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia later on in life. And then some imaging studies have also shown that you can preserve brain function and brain volume by using those therapies. And of course, we need more research. We certainly always need more research. But I think that we just don't really use the research that we have as best as we could, because there is research that is hardly ever mentioned. And I find that bizarre. And then, of course, lifestyle is also really important. And if you say diet, Exercise. I've seen you <laughs> skipping oh, rope. Jumping rope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a good good example of things you have to keep doing, right? Just you have to keep doing it till we die. Muscle is magic and menopause, but also cardiovascular activity. What's right. interesting is, you know, we know the research. I'm familiar with the research that shows the more and more frequent and um, hot flashes you have, it increases your, where it's associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Yes. So is that saying, is that true? If we have more hot flashes, are we at risk? And is that a red flag for neurologic disease? So um, potentially. So there's it's like a symptom, it's a signpost, right? It's like, okay, pay attention to this, don't power through it. Let's yes. Attack. Yes, so there is evidence that early hot flashes, like women who start, they're called the early flashers, 
when you start having hot flashes earlier in life, even during the premenopausal stage or early perimenopausal stage, and especially if the hot flashes are severe, that is associated with an increased risk of epithelial damage, which is a risk factor for heart disease in turn. And we also know that the more hot flashes you have, especially at night, so th those would be the night sweats, right? Uh, the higher your chances of having white matter lesions mm -hmm. in your brain, which is not great because it, it's sometimes non-specific, but it is a sign that there is something affecting the myelin in your brain, which is the fiber or the structure that covers your neurons and enables effective communication between different neurons. And that is also a risk factor for stroke and vascular dementia later on in life. So like you said, hot flashes are not just a quality of life issue. Uh, for many years, that was the notion that if you have a hot flash, you just grin and bear it and eventually it'll go away. And now there's an understanding that the hot flash is not just heat, it's a neurological reaction that impacts multiple systems, multiple biological and neurophysiological systems that need to be taken quite seriously because it may be a sign of a disruption in the cardiovascular system and potentially the neurological system. And that's something that nobody wants or needs, especially because hot flashes can't be alleviated in different ways, including hormone therapies, but also non-hormonal therapies. And for some women, lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, and some supplements and whatnot. So but preferably all of those, right? <laughs> you want to have a very healthy baseline lifestyle status and then build up on top of that. So Lisa, as I'm thinking about the increase in estrogen receptors postmenopausally mm -hmm. for you know, as long as there's, you know, some circulating estrogen available. Is it, is it enhanced by estrogen replacement or is it, does it stop the development of those estrogen receptors? We don't know yet. That's what we're doing right now. We have 12 women in the study so far, which is amazing. We need more. So if you know anyone who might want to work with us, we would be thrilled. How would they get, how would they connect with you to work with you? Uh, that's a really good question. So we have a, <laughs> a work in academia. So a website is kind of pathetic, but I <laughs> have said actually scratch that. I'm, I'm going to start again. Our website is in progress, but I'm hoping it will be ready by the time this podcast comes out. And so then you would just Google my name and Wild Cornell, which is spelled W-E-I-L-L. -L while Cornell, and that should come up on top, Women's Brain Initiative. Okay. And there's Sorry. our contact information at email address. Another way is to connect with me on Instagram, and then we would, my team would send all the information and email addresses and best contacts to reach us. Probably that's the easiest Okay, way. perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Um, be sure to follow Dr. Moscone on Dr. Lisa Moscone on Instagram. And again, to search for her on the internet at while, <laughs> while <Yes>. Cornell, <laughs> the brain initiative, really women's brain initiative. And you pop up all over the place with that search. So that's really a good way to access. And again, more studies and intuitively, um, what are, what are you expecting with progesterone? One of the things I was looking at a study yesterday, I was just trying to find it, but I was looking at a study recently that looked at progesterone replacement also increases estrogen mm -hmm. level, which makes sense with or without estrogen replacement decreases FSH. So we think about these, mm -hmm. um, you know, these pituitary hormones that are, you know, designed FSH and LH to stimulate the ovaries, but they increase as we age. And that's associated with, you know, we know a higher level of FSH is associated with higher risk of osteoporosis. So more bone turnover, um, less muscle cell regeneration and repair, and also um, brown fat converting to white fat. So less metabolically active fat. But we know with hormone uh, replacement therapy, and when I talk about hormone replacement therapy, I only initiate bioidentical, what's identical to our body in hormone replacement therapy. 
But what we've seen is that drops the FSH and LH. Mm -hmm. So it decreases those um, markers and risk factors. And increasing FSH and LH levels are also a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease in women. We published this a couple of months ago where we, we, we find actually my, uh, my PhD student, Matilde Nerattini, has shown that um, after menopause, very high FSH and LH levels predict the presence of Alzheimer's plaques in women's brains. So this is another completely overlooked and unexplored potential mechanism by which menopause is related to an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease in women. So the estrogen goes down, estrogen is neuroprotective and you lose the kind of protection. And at the same time, FSH and LH increase, which seems to be for some women somehow pro-inflammatory or an oxidative factor. And that may be associated, at least in the studies that we have done. And there's only one more study so far, but there really seems to be an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And there's a ton of preclinical research showing these effects. So that's another reason I believe to investigate hormone therapy for Alzheimer's prevention and for support of cognitive function, because we have so much evidence coming from different fields and different lines of evidence suggesting that, that there are so many mechanisms that we could work with to reduce the risk and progesterone therapy is one way, estrogen therapy is, is another way. Uh, you know, you can block the gonadotropines being produced and there's so much, there's so much. There's, need to there's do. so much, there's so much in your, your book covers a lot. Your book covers so much of, of this. And I, you know, just to uh, keep track of you and follow you to continue to look at the the trail you're blazing. And I'm so glad you took the initiative to lead in this area. I wonder too, uh, Lisa, the, you know, you think, okay, menopause, and you talk about this, the three Ps, puberty, pregnancy, and uh, perimenopause as these huge amounts of transition time in neurocognitive health. So when we're designed to rewire the brain, in menopause, that's a the perimenopause. There's a rewiring happen. Why, why do you think it's in this way, like historically or evolutionary? Mm. Why, why we're rewiring? And I always think, okay, I don't want to do anything. Like I, I no more would suppress puberty from happening than I would suppress any of the positive changes in menopause from happening, especially neurologically, like the continuation of est creating estrogen receptors and however else, all the mysteries in the woman's brain, right? But what do you think is the design of this? Where is that fine line? Yes, I have I have a theory about that that I also shared in the book that the three Ps are neuroendocrine transition states that really have a reason to be. So with puberty, we know that the brain actually shrinks, right? So teenagers are shedding brain cells at high velocity, and that generates some difficult situations and your kids are I have have four daughters all you know, the youngest is a teenager still so this oh is fascinating. this makes sense a lot more sense now yes everything makes more sense my daughter is nine and I'm already talking to her about all these things that, that we're both ready <laughs> when we're having a bad day we both know what's happening and we can relax but we, we know that teenagers have very strong emotions. They have changes in sleep patterns. They, they have changes in body temperature, for sure. There's a lot of big emotion. There's recklessness. But there's also brain fog. They're also forgetful. They have trouble focusing. And it's important to realize that this is the same system that is then altered or rewired as women go through menopause, right? So starting at puberty, our brains get synchronized with our ovaries. And every time our ovaries cycle, the brain actually microcycles. And that's something really important to realize. Obviously we're not slaves to our hormones. Hormones are not the only thing that matters for brain functionality, but there is a bit of an impact and some women are more sensitive to this impact than other women. Again, there's a range, 
we're all different. However, there's the similar shared physiology or neurophysiology that's important to consider. And the brain sheds neurons. And the idea is that the brain is getting leaner and leaner because if you're a brain, it's really expensive to have all these neurons. And if you don't need them, it's better to let them go. And there's this pruning that's happening that very selectively boosts specific brain regions that are part of the theory of mind network, which is what makes humans really unique. It's their ability to empathize and socialize and mentalize and put ourselves into another person's shoes, right? And so the idea is that puberty does come at a cost, as every mom can tell you, every parent can tell you. But the good news is that it really makes the teenage brain able to become an adult and become a member of society and able to live with others. So that's really important. Then pregnancy arrives. And at first there's an explosion of hormones in brain cells, but all this kind of goes kaput after the postpartum, during the postpartum period when the brain rewires itself another time and also before during pregnancy in a way that once again strengthens the theory of mind network, but it, it really boosts more primitive parts of the brain, like the amygdala, which is the emotional center of the brain, because as mothers, we need to develop a sixth sense. You need to be able to understand what the little person over there is trying to tell, but it's, it's trying to communicate without having language. <laughs> <laughs> so you really need to read minds quite literally. And that is tapping into your more primitive brain to be able to do that besides survival, no sleep, and all the other wonderful things and superpowers that mothers develop. But then you have the baby blues or perhaps the postpartum depression or the brain fog. Even the hat flashes, one third of all pregnant women will have some hat flashes at some point or the other. Because again, it's the same system. So it enables you to evolve and do beautiful things, but sometimes there are glitches. And I think it's important to appreciate this whole picture situation because then menopause comes along and you're older at that point, your ability to, uh, you know, of yourself's ability to renew and recover is a little bit slower at that point. So it takes longer to feel better for some women. But again, it's a similar mechanism that um, you shed neurons probably because all the neurons that you needed to get pregnant and have a menstrual cycle are no longer needed. So those can go at a minimum. At the same time, the rewiring, although the symptoms are definitely a problem and something to address for many women, there's also a reason for it, which is that the brain is rewiring itself to go into a non-reproductive stage of life where you need your brain to carry on even after your ovaries have partially shut down. And that seems to be important from an evolutionary perspective in that women are supposed, according to these theories, to become more leader, to, to, to take on more of a leadership role in society and to really become mothers to all beings. The grandmother yeah. philosophy, right? The yeah, yeah, it's the grandmother's hypothesis. A lot of people don't buy into it. To me, it makes a lot of sense. And again, if you've ever had a grandmother, I think it's undeniable that older women are extremely effective and really important parts of society. And they really like this idea of the elder woman who is wise and well-respected, it can really help all. And there seems to be neurological transformations that do allow you to do that because your frontal cortex, it becomes a little bit more activated when you need to make a decision, which is your rational part of your brain. And the reactive primitive amygdala is very selectively turned off so that you don't feel as strongly negative emotions. So overall, there's greater peace of mind and um, mental clarity about what really matters and what doesn't, which of course needs to be better researched. But I, I like that. I, I'm 
I'm leaning into that. <laughs> I, I'm leaning into it too. I love it. I, I really do. I love that. And we know from longevity perspectives, multi-generational households have higher quality of life, lower illness, stronger immune systems, better mental stability. And uh, so, yeah, I'm leaning in. I'm leaning in. I have a grandbaby now since I talked to you last. So totally enjoying uh, enjoying her. I love being the grandmother and uh, or Tata, as we say. And, uh, and so with this, how would you redefine menopause with all you've learned and all you've brought forward in science and looking at women's brains and the, you know, the, the blessings and the areas that need to be um, optimized and supported? How, how would you redefine menopause? I hate that term. So <laughs> um, what I can say is that what we've learned is that menopause is a renovation project on the brain that comes with strength and with vulnerability. So for me, it's just another neuroendocrine transition that is part of being a woman and this part of life. At the same time, the symptoms are no joke. And I think it's really important to address them for women who need medical care and support. And overall, I think I would I would just really like to embrace it as a normal part of normal is not the right word, but just as a part of a woman's life. And I told my husband, you know, when, when I was pregnant, everybody was so happy for me. It was like I'd done something amazing. And then the baby showers and cards and support. And if I if I had a bad day, people would hug me. I I want the same when I go through menopause. You know, I want gifts. <laughs> Right, absolutely. <laughs> but at least cake. <laughs> I, I think it's 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 just something I look forward to aging in part because I work in Alzheimer's disease and I'm constantly reminded of how precious aging is. That it really is a gift, and I personally I just want to make the absolute most out of it. So I'm really, I'm not in menopause. I'm, I have a regular menstrual cycle. And so this is my chance to prepare for the transition and then changing my lifestyle as best I can. I'm optimizing it as best yeah. as I can so that I have a strong foundation to help my body and my brain as I go through it. How would you redefine it? Do you have like a word that you like? Well I think, and you mentioned this in your book, and, uh, you know, when I heard the Japanese word konenki, meaning konenki. Spring, I think that's a perfect example of redefining menopause, renewal to, you know, re, you know, it's just a vital for life. And when I think of the second spring, a second yeah. spring, I mean, it's very that's positive amazing. and it's beautiful. Um you know, and some people will refer to the stage of life as the second 50 or, but again, it's not, it's not to be, it's a transition. I like how you say that it's a transition. It's a time for opening up and not for shutting down. It's a time to utilize yeah. all the gifts that we have yeah. in a positive way, you know, putting that forward and not playing small, playing big. So, yeah. I love it. There's a there's a friend of mine who uses the word perennials to define women as we get older, right? We're perennial. not annual, we're perennials, we're evergreens. Yes. And I like that as well. I personally really love being a woman. I love women. And I think we're just really setting ourselves up for failure by talking about menopause and being in menopause as something that is a downside. You know, it, I would love for all of us to just support each other and be be proactive for sure and seek help if needed, but also be open about this process so that the fear and the stigma and all this, this nonsense <laughs> really goes away. I agree. I agree. And and the work you're doing is helping do that in spades. So I want to thank you. Tell our audience again about your books. You have the most recent one, The Menopause Brain, but you have others. And also, again, how to connect with you. So and I could talk with you forever. And I know I've got to let you go. But uh, I so enjoy our conversation. So this is my third book. Um, my first book was Brain Food. And which is actually very similar to what you have been doing with your diet and your, your teachings. And my second book was The XX Brain, 
which is really all about Alzheimer's prevention in women. So if anybody is concerned about Alzheimer's risk, that's a really, I think it's a good book to have. And this is The Menopause Brain, it's my third. And I'm very blessed that Maria Shriver wrote the foreword to all of my books. I love her so much and she's such a powerhouse and she's such a wonderful person. And she also funded the research on the brain estrogen imaging. Uh, with her women's Alzheimer's movement. So we're so eternally grateful to her. And yeah, the book was an international bestseller. So I'm really excited about that too. But most I'm really happy to take the research out of the lab and make it accessible and actionable to all women because there's so much disinformation out there. And now that menopause is a little bit more of a hot topic, everybody's kind of jumping on the wagon and, and telling you to take this weird supplement or to do a headstand to get rid of brain fog. You know, you can find anything on the internet. So it's really, I think it's helpful to know that there are some things that are evidence-based and some things that are under development. And then there are things that are really coming out of nowhere. And I wanted to make sure that at least what we know in science and medicine was in, in a book that anyone can read when it comes to brain health. Specifically. Yeah. Again, I'm a brain person. Right. And it is so, and again, it does, it gives a lot of hope, hope and support and things to do, right? Right. It's very yeah. actionable. Yeah. The, you know, again, I always say it's 90, it's over 90% nutrition and lifestyle. And then there's a little tweaking that we can do that, you know, comes into play with what we can write on a prescription pad or, mm -hmm. um, and, and imaging is powerful because you can track the progress. You yeah. can see the improvement. So having the science is again, really invaluable and helps us clinicians mm -hmm. help our patients and also to eliminate fear to continue to give them hope and, and actionable items. And validation. Validation. Had so many women say, I went to my doctor and I mentioned the brain fog and the mood changes and they just said it will pass or they didn't believe me or they said it was stress. We have patients who, who, who came to us in tears with a prescription for psychotherapy. You know, So I think that, that having actual research is important for the patients and for the doctors as well, who can see, oh, they were not making things up. You know, it's not just that you're a woman, you're weak, which by the way, I find that really bizarre. Very offensive. I power yes. through anything, anything. But anyway, so I think it's really important to have this hard evidence, right? Clinicians want hard evidence and we are doing the best that we can to provide as much as we can. Awesome. So you guys search Dr. Lisa Moscone on Instagram. Be sure to follow her, connect with her if you're interested in partaking in her studies and just to stay current. I mean, it is a big deal. So June um, in Nature Magazine, your research is being published and I'm really excited to get up my hands on a copy and I can't yeah. wait. Oh, and it's free. It's free to download. So I'll share the link for sure. And we made it free to download. So we had to pay extra because <laughs> this is the world we live in. But please do, do download a copy if you don't mind, because that's the way the journals realize what matters to readers, not just to scientists. Mm -hmm. And that increases our chances of getting more work published in good journals. So that would be wonderful. It's completely free. I don't, I, I don't oh, get it. Just that is amazing. Back. Thank you for making that available. And we'll put these links uh, to her Thank social, you. to her website, and to this article, this published research um, in, below in the show notes as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your time and valuable information with us today, Lisa. Thank you for having me. It was so nice to see you. Always a pleasure. Always welcome. Always welcome. <laughs>